I'm broken. I'm a failure. Business has gone bust. I've had to sack 10 people. I'm a rubbish husband. I'm chubby. I'm broke. So broke. I failed my family. I failed myself. I'm useless. It's full of so much rage and despair. I don't deserve to be happy. I don't even deserve to be here. God, this sounds like the shopping list of a right miserable git. (laughs) And I can tell you, back then, I was not invited to many parties at all. (laughs) Eleven years ago, this was me. And I had a long shopping list. All of my strength gone to fight for something that I didn't feel I deserved anymore. This picture was taken of me at Christmas 2010. The day after, I'd just moved back home to my parents' house. I was 23 stone, depressed. And at that time, whilst I'm smiling on the outside, I mean, it is Christmas, so I guess I didn't make it to one party at least. If you look at those eyes and look at that body language, you can see the fear on the inside. I kind of felt like, you know when you get that last banana of the fruit bowl? Kind of bashed and bruised, nobody really wants to use it anymore. And it's all soft and squidgy on the inside. Just sort of good for smashing up and making into banana bread or obliterating and turning into a smoothie. 35 years old, moving back to my teenage bedroom. Complete with Bon Jovi CDs and Star Wars posters. Definitely not the place I thought I was going to be in my 20s. But far better than the place I almost ended up. Wrapped around a tree on a country road. Driving back to the house that used to be my home. You see, back in those days, I'd been working really long hours. Putting the work in, trying to solve things, trying to get things right. And if I'm honest, I was avoiding going back to that awkward silence, to the stuff that we weren't saying each, to each other, to that house where my wife and I live separate rooms and separate lives. And I guess I was trying to solve things, I was trying to make things right, I was trying to be the man, the king, make stuff happen, get it fixed, sort it all out, kind of ride on in there and fix the situation. screwed it all up completely. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to fix things. And so I got desperate. I froze. I was scared. I didn't know that it was okay not to be okay. Do you know what I mean? And so I decided that was it. I'm not going to keep going. I don't deserve to be here anymore. It's very misty, that road, very dark. But it was a bit like that, the road that I was on. It was a murky October night, just before that Christmas. And I was driving back on a country road like this, going back to that house where I just feel, I didn't feel I belonged anymore. And I decided there and then, that was it. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to just get rid of this problem right here, right now. So I took my seatbelt off put my foot down on the accelerator. I decided when I was looking at that road, which of those trees I was going to ram my car into, just a couple of feet from the side of the road. Oblivion. Momentary pain and then silence. But there wouldn't have been silence. No, there would have been the sound of metal on wood of bone through glass, of fire, of smoke, of chaos. I know my luck at the time, the airbags would have worked. For me, it was just, in that split moment, my mind went forward to my funeral, to the faces of my family, my mum, my dad, my brother, my friends, and their despair at my passing. I was then questioning why. 
Why hadn't they spotted anything was wrong? Why hadn't I asked for help? Why hadn't I been strong enough to reach out and ask for support? And I realised I couldn't do it to them. Kind of the guilt to the guilt I would have been left with stopped me. So I eased off the accelerator. One hand on the steering wheel, I put my seat back back on. Safety first. (laughs) And I drove back to the house. And then within a couple of days I got help. First of all, I got help from a GP. And then I also got help from a friend of mine who was a coach, an NLP coach. And getting that medication really started to help. Kind of the antidepressants got rid of a lot of that shopping list, quieted the voice down in my head. And the coaching actually really improved the communication between my wife and I. Within a couple of months, we decided that we probably should split up once and for all. That whilst we were still talking to each other and still friends, now was the time to stop. And the interesting thing was actually that was a great decision. I mean, fortunately, we had cats and not kids. So moving on was a lot easier than it was for some. And that's when I moved back to be with my parents. You see, my mum was a palliative care nurse, and my dad was in the Navy, if you know that song. <laughs> it was a job for life for him when he joined in his teens. And so I was born in Plymouth. Any Plymouthians out here? Any Janners? Excellent. Come on the greens. Oh, no, you're a support Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> So I was born in Plymouth, but lived most of my life in Portsmouth, basically anywhere where there's a port, somewhere we lived. And that's where I grew up. And as I was growing up, it's really interesting just watching and acknowledging that by going back to my home, I suddenly recognised that I had that home again. That environment for my family was like, like plugging myself back into the charger. I spent so much time on low power mode, that last 10% of battery just hanging on. I'd forgotten what it was like to be back in the green again. And by getting recharged, by getting replenished, I suddenly recognised that I could go and see my friends. I had time to just be with myself and my thoughts. It was okay to focus on me, but that shouldn't be guilty about doing that. And so the first thing I focused on, with, to be honest, so much going wrong in my life, was my health. Being 23 stone, I thought, I'll start there. And I started learning about health. I started learning about eating, about exercise. And I found this amazing guy called Topsy, my best friend now. (laughs) And I started going along to his boot camps, to his fitness classes, once, twice, three, four times a week. I know, and he will admit this to you if you ever meet him, that he thought I was absolute lost cause the first class I ever went to. No hope, he thought. But I committed. I kept going. I kept doing the classes. And as I changed my body and I changed my strength inside, it started to change my mindset. Within nine months, I'd lost six and a half stone in weight. 32 kilos. Try and imagine 32 bags of sugar here. That's how much much I lost from around my body. Thank you. (laughs) And I started setting goals for my fitness. I was doing 5K races, 10K races. In 2014, I even did a triathlon. Anybody here done a triathlon? Well done. I wouldn't recommend those. The (laughs) hardest thing I've ever done in my life. A triathlon is a a swim, a bike ride and a run. The swim was okay, it was in Portsmouth Harbour. Against some changing tides, it took me a while, but I got there in the end. Bike ride was okay, I could ride a bike. And then the run. (laughs) Run, jog. Jog, walk. (laughs) Okay, between friends, walk, walk. It's the hardest thing I ever had to finish up with. It took me nearly three hours to cross that line. And I knew I was near the back of the finishing line because by the time I got to the water stations, they'd already packed up and gone. <laughs> and for the last two kilometres, I had the St. John's ambulance bikes with me just to make sure that I crossed the line. But I crossed the line. I got my medal. Wow. <laughs> I'd done it. And I'd never do it again. But not only did I done it for me, I'd also done it to raise money for Parkinson's UK. That was a charity that, for me and my family, was becoming very pertinent in our lives. See, a few years before this had happened, my dad had been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And he was in his mid-50s, and at that time, we wouldn't see much impact from it. So, carry on regardless, do your job, get everything done, it will be okay. But as time rolled on, it definitely started to have that impact. 
it started to steal his confidence, his job, his mobility, his speech, and ultimately, just the age of 63, his life. It had a massive impact. My parents, by this time, had started to move back down to the West Country, in Saltash, near Plymouth, which is where a lot of my family live now. And it's a place where, in our sort of growing up years when I was a kid, we spent so much time down there. Easters, holidays, half terms, basically any excuse my mum had to go down there and get a bit of respite from two pretty boisterous sons. And that's where he lived out those final hours, his final days. He was at home, having palliative care. I guess having a partner who was a palliative care nurse was quite handy. In those final days when he was surrounded with my brother, my mum, and the carers that had been so amazing at caring for him, it was his time to go. But he never made it to my second wedding that summer. By the time I got married again, he was just too poorly. But I did get to tell him that he would have been a granddad. And even in those last days, just a week or so before he died, I saw that recognition and pride in his eyes. You see, Sophie and I met. She's up there. Hello. <laughs> We were introduced to a friend of ours called Caitlin. We thought we'd make quite good partnership. And I've got to say, several years later, she was pretty right. <laughs> I not only did become a partner to Sophie, I also became a stepdad to Fred, somebody I'm immensely proud of. And Sophie lived here in Lewisham, and that's where my Lewisham part of the journey comes. See, I'm a relative newcomer, several years. So. And this borough for me has been a place of change of sadness, of fear, of joy, of empowerment. And not only that, but we've also had two daughters ourselves, both born here. In fact, both born at home in Hither Green. Our first Megan staged a, a speedy entrance into the world. You see, Sophie had been labouring overnight and things had calmed down come the morning. And the, the amazing home birth team, the poppy team from Lewisham Hospital, had said, we'll give you some space. We'll go home, and if anything changes, just give us a quick call. They left. Fred went to school. About half an hour later, everything changed. <laughs> and it's okay. We've got this. I mean, Sophie's a doula. She helps women give birth and teaches it in the birthing. I help people stay calm. <laughs> we got this. And within 20 minutes, Megan has sped into the world, popped out like a cork into my arms, the most important catch I ever made. <laughs> and as Sophie's there with her hands on the side of the bath, and I pass Megan back through the legs to her, I was hit by that overwhelming feeling of love. That raw emotion of seeing your child brought into the world. But I would only by the raw emotion of losing my dad. We didn't stop there, of course. We had another one. Beatrice, a couple of years ago, came into the world. This time, another planned home birth. Birth pool was set up in the living room. Curtains were closed, the music was on softly, the lights were dimmed and everything was safe and secure. She was a little bit better in the middle of the afternoon, this time guided out by Sophie into the world, smiling and ready to change lives as well. These two events I will never, ever forget, both again attached to home, For me, my work now is as a trainer, as a speaker. I help empower organisations and individuals to, to let go of this stuff that we hang on to, to know that there is always hope and support. I recognise now that as I look back at those events in my lives, I hadn't lost the way. I just lost the ability to help me find the way. There's an exercise that I often do with my coaching clients which is, uh, if you could ask your 80-year-old self to give you advice, what might that 80-year-old self give you as that advice? You know, with the hindsight of their experience and their love, what would your 80-year-old self say? And mine's maybe a shopping list. Prunes, <coughs> dentifix. No, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I 
I was a son and a brother. I was a dad and a stepdad. I was fixable. I was evolving. I was a student and a teacher. I was moving forward. I was a shining light. I was enough. I was worthy. I was a success. I am a success. Thank you.